So welcome back to another first play. For this episode, I'm going to be taking a look at Legendary Axe for the TurboGrafx-16. Um, I'm pretty excited. I've really been looking forward to um, doing some uh, TurboGrafx content on this channel. Um, as you've seen, um, my previous videos are mostly on the Sega and uh, Atari game consoles, but uh, TurboGrafx-16 is one of my f favorite consoles. Um, I actually... Uh, purchased my Turbo Graphics kind of at the end of its life. Um, uh, I was basically at Toys R Us, and my my dad was like walking in the the video game section. And he's like, "What's a Turbo Graphics?" And I'm like, "Well, that's a that's a Sega Genesis com competitor." At the time, I owned the Sega Genesis, and um, you know he couldn't help but notice the the clearance tag on it was twenty nine ninety nine for the game console with uh, Keith Courage, and let's just say that was an an instantaneous decision. I kind of grabbed the Turbo Graphics, and um, this was right around the time that uh, the Turbo Duo had dropped, and they were trying to clear out all the old stock at Turbo Graphics. So, uh, Toys R Us they basically clear all the consoles, and most of the uh, Turbo Graphics 16 games were about 9.99, and I bought pretty much everything that I could carry. Um, I picked up, um, you know, most of the TV sports. Uh, games like TV Sports Basketball, uh, Box Adventure, uh, all the classic games. Uh, unfortunately, Legendary Axe wasn't part of that bundle. Um, these were basically the leftover games that were just kind of uh, collecting dust in Toys R Us. And all these years, um, I never played Legendary Axe. And, you know, it's a shame, too, because I had a lot of conversations about Legendary Axe over the years. My um, in my neighborhood, there was nobody who owned a TurboGrafx-16. I was basically the only kid with a Turbo, and that probably explains why I want clearance. Um, the, uh, the system was great, though, um, and my cousin in New Jersey owned one, and we used to have conversations all the time about, uh, various games on the Turbo, and he, you know, this was before I owned a TurboGrafx, so he was always bragging about his Turbo Express. He had the handheld as well as the, uh, the game console, because... What was neat about the Turbo Graphics, and it wasn't like um, until the Switch kind of showed up, is you could basically use the uh, Hue cards in both the home game console as well as their portable system, and they were really the only system to do that up until the Switch. I mean, it, it just it was an unthinkable thing, and you know he used to um, you know go on vacation with his little Turbo Express, and when he was home, he would game on his. Uh, Turbo Graphics 16 at uh, you know, hooked up to his TV. So, um, Legendary Axe is a game he was always talking about. And now that I'm playing it the first time, uh, I got to say this is this is a fun little game. Um, the uh, the gameplay kind of reminds me of uh, Rastan or Rygar. Uh, you're basically running around, and it's a hack and slash kind of platformer. But uh, the controls are very approachable. This is uh, pretty intuitive. I mean. The Turbo Graphics really only had the two two action buttons, and in this game, uh, the one button is attack, and the other button is jump, and it, it could be more straightforward. And um, that's one of the things I loved about the Turbo Graphics is, uh, for a casual gamer like me, um, it wasn't complicated. You know, the the thing that I hated about PC gaming um, later in the '90s was, you know, all these games they they had to do these tutorials because the the complexity of the gameplay, and and I lost interest in video gaming around this period of time because I don't want to have to, to spend a half hour learning the controls for a game. I just want to jump in and have some fun with it and uh, you know I, I only game probably you know 20-25 minutes a day. I don't put a lot of time into it um, and, and yeah the the more complex the game the, the less fun it is for me. I grew up in the Atari era um, where we had like a single fire button and um, it just there was magic to a lot of those old games like Pac-Man and uh, Moon Patrol and um, I, I don't I don't like complexity because of just the era I guess of gaming that I came from so this Turbo Graphics game I mean the controls are really tight um, oh crap I just fell into the lava um, anywho um, this uh, this game is pretty fun you know, they've made some unusual choices, uh, like fighting a spider, and it seems like I, the the bats are treacherous in this game. And uh, I guess I'm fighting a dragon right now. I don't know what I'm I'm fighting, but 
this is kind of a this is kind of shame that uh, the Turbo Graphics wasn't more screen stream because this is a really fun action platformer, and and you know this is a genre that I don't think people are making this type of game anymore. It's just um, everything is 3D nowadays, and there really aren't a lot of 2D side-scrolling hack and slash games anymore. Not that I I remember because I know I picked up some. Uh, modern updated retro titles like on the Xbox and PlayStation uh, that are, are 2D side scrollers. I believe Strider is the closest thing that I played recently um, to a game like this, but different kind of genre. I mean, this is this is old school mythology, and uh, you know, I, I I would think that this is probably. Uh, supposed to take place like a thousand years ago or something judging from the guy running around with an axe and not um, even a belt bow and arrow so I will say this about this game though the, the colors are, are really colorful on the turbo um, the graphics on this one are kind of eh, you know the turbo graphics was in reality an 8-bit game console they called it a turbo graphics 16 to try to market the fact that it could do like 16-bit uh, colors but a lot of these games on the Turbo Graphics, I've noticed, uh, often they will look kind of like a, an NES game, and that's that's because the the, the, the processor in the Turbo Graphics was very similar to an NES processor. So there's a lot of platformers that kind of feel and look like an NES game. Although the color palette's a lot better on the the Turbo Graphics, I believe it can do like 512 colors on screen. So, but they they don't appear to be using the 512 colors on this particular game. I mean, this looks like the Gen Genesis color palette, and the Genesis was limited to about 60, 64 colors on screen, so um, it looks kind of like uh, an NES game with a Genesis palette to me. The game itself is a lot of fun, but they're certainly not showing off the 16-bit graphics on this particular game. I mean, all the sprites are kind of small. Uh, it just, it just kind of feels and, and plays a little too much like an NES game for my taste, so... Uh, I'm maybe, in hindsight, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of being hypercritical. I mean, this is a 1990 game, so this would have been probably a release title for the TurboGrafx-16, so I guess you can't really get upset that the graphics aren't really kind of up to par with some of the other TurboGrafx games. Because, don't get me wrong, the TurboGrafx-16 could do some really amazing graphics, especially later in its life. You know, if you uh, take a look at the, like, the Street Fighter II port, it has one of the best... Street Fighter 2 games, and they actually had to uh, bundle a six-button gamepad because the you know the Turbo Graphics gamepad only had two action buttons, and you can't play Street Fighter with two buttons. You gotta you need the six, so they did uh, bundle that particular game with a six-button gamepad to uh, be able to play it. You know, consistent with the other other versions of the game out there. I, you know, I will say this: boulders now too. Uh, the music is actually pretty good on this one, though. I mean, it, they got some catchy tunes going on this one. Um, but they made some kind of unusual choices, like, you know, fighting a spider, and now I'm, you know, fighting a rock boulder. I mean, these are really bizarre choices for enemies. You know, most games that I would think of like this, you know, you'd be fighting huge monsters and taking up the full screen, and um, they kind of kind of did make some kind of bizarre choices on what you're actually fighting in this game but I'm, I'm not gonna really badmouth the two um, if I were doing a, a review of this particular game I'd probably rate this one about a 7 7.5 out of 10 because the, the game mechanics and the, the gameplay are phenomenal I mean this is a fun fun action game I just uh I'm just a little underwhelmed by the graphics. The music is good, though, too. So, I mean, 7.5, that'd be, you know, my metric would be it's better than 75% of the games out there. That's that's what I would say, 75 uh, or 7.5. That's kind of how I benchmark my, my reviews. But um, this is this is a pretty great game. I, I, I understand why my cousin was so ecstatic about it, you know, back circa 1990, 91, because... Uh, it's a hell of a lot of fun. I mean, it does play a lot like Rastan in the arcade for me. I mean, I, I think that's probably what they were emulating. They probably took 
be, I mean, even Ch Jesus level looks exactly like the first level of Rastan. So, um, they definitely liberated, I think, that Rastan and, and, and decided they wanted a home version of that particular arcade game. So, I get it. Um, and, and, you know, the graphics in this thing are probably similar to the arcade version of Rastan, although you gotta, you gotta realize, I think Rostin came out in, I think, I wanna say 1986 in the arcades, so four years later on a home game console uh, to have equivalent graphics, I mean, that's, that's, that's pretty good, I mean, the, the Turbo Graphics and the Genesis were kind of mind-blowing when they first came out, um, I, I had to wait a couple years before I got my first 16-bit machine, I, I, I didn't get my Genesis until 92, and I believe my Turbo Graphics I bought in 93. I think that's when the beginning and the end happened. Uh, what happened with the Turbo Graphics was um, they kind of switched teams and marketing. Um, they yanked out of retail when the Turbo Duo dropped in the USA, and they decided to basically do mail order instead of being in retail stores, from what I understand. And the company changed names, you know, uh, from 1989 to about 1992, it was all NEC, NEC, NEC. And then in 1993, when the Turbo Duo came out, um, they started selling games in mail order, and it was Turbo Technologies. Um, you know, they, they basically had a catalog, and you would buy games through Turbo Technologies. And, and the reason I know that is um, when the system kind of died... I still wanted to play new games on it, and I, I started buying the Hue cards from Turbo Technologies through the catalog, and that's how I kept my Turbo going to about 94, 95. I mean, I kept uh, buying certain titles. Uh, one of the, the titles that I did kind of miss out on was I never got Bonk 3. I got to sit down and play Bonk 3 because uh, I heard I heard it's really good, but um, it was really rare, and, you know, Bonk 3 came out in the U.S., after um, the Turbo Graphics kind of ran out of steam and was no longer in retail stores, so I, I didn't purchase that one. Um, I'm trying to remember the, the the I only ordered like two or three games through Turbo Technologies, and then uh, by '95 I had moved on to next gen platforms, and I had a PlayStation One, and uh, I also had a Atari Jaguar. But the Atari Jaguar is again another one that I bought at the end of its life. And they were clearancing the systems. I think I paid $49 for the Atari Jaguar console that I bought. Because same kind of thing. Toys R Us clearanced them. The games were 9 bucks a piece. And the, t the game console was like 49 if I remember right. And um, that's probably why I have a positive um, attitude towards the Atari Jaguar. Is because I got it so cheap. Same thing with the, the Turbo Graphics. You know, when you buy these systems at the end of the life... And you only pay like twenty nine dollars for the game console. You probably have a very positive experience because it was so cheap, and the quality was there. You know, at least enough on the Turbo games. The Atari Jaguar, you know, games were a mixed bag. They definitely had some really amazing games. Like everybody always talks about Alien vs Predator and Tempest two thousand, um, but the, you know there there were there were about a dozen really good games on the Jaguar and about. 30, 35 release titles that were shovelware, so, uh, you know, about 25% of them were, were really good games. Um, the Turbo Graphics probably had a higher quality, um, definitely had a higher quality um, amount. I have a feeling that, you know, if you look at the uh, reviews of the time, the Turbo Graphics probably had, probably, I would say about 50%. Of the games were really good because the Turbo Graphics didn't get a lot of releases, but their quality control did seem really good. Um, I remember a lot more Bonk's Revenge and Air Zonks to um, I'm trying to I can't even think of a, 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 a stinker title on the, the Turbo Graphics really. I mean, they were all pretty good. Um, I guess a lot of people were disappointed with games like Final Lap Twin and. Uh, I'm trying to think of another one that people hated. Not that many. I mean, honestly, it was mostly the NES at that time that was notorious for shovelware. Um, the NES, for every one classic, there were probably like 15 stinkers. I mean, you 
you had so many game companies that shouldn't have been developing games like LGN, like LJN, and I mean, Karate Kid is one of the worst video games I've ever played in my life, and I've got a review coming up on that one. And I, that's the first review where I'm tempted to rate with negative numbers because it's not even a one out of ten from, you know, Karate Kid is just such a short pathetic the, the game mechanics are terrible I, i'm it's probably the first review i've ever really seriously considered rating a game negatively so um turbo graphics i don't think has a title in the entire library that is as bad as you know some of the stinkers on the nes but uh i'm progressing you know reasonably well i mean I, this game does have um uh an increasing difficulty level i've noticed that the i'm already i'm only on level three and and the difficulty is definitely, you know, cranked up from level one, so this game definitely ramps up pretty quick on difficulty. But the game is fun, and, and um, you know, there's a lot of power-ups, and uh, it seems like you you got to have that power bar. Um, what's neat about this is you notice the little power bar on the top left of the screen. Um, it's it's kind of like a, a shooter, like R-Type, where you can power up your gun. Well... In this game, you know, if you don't swing it, the axe gets more powerful. So, if you have to rapid swing the axe, you're not doing that much damage. But if you save up and let that thing power up, the hit is much stronger. So, this is kind of a... I mean, they did a lot of cool innovations on this game. Um, 7.5 out of 10, maybe an 8 out of 10. This is This is a fun game. Uh, like I said, my my biggest disappointment is the graphics, but um, uh, the gameplay is just phenomenal. Uh, this is just a really great platformer. Um, no wonder my cousin was raving about it. I can see why he played this game nonstop. This is just a great game. I mean, if you if you are trying to get into the Turbo Graphics, then uh, I'd probably recommend starting up with this one and probably Box Adventure, Box Revenge. Um, those are definitely the the games to kind of introduce yourself to the system. I think. The Turbo was a commercial flop in the U.S., mostly because the packing game was terrible. I, I never liked Keith Courage. I mean, it was it came with my game console, and I played it once or twice, but, you know, it mostly was a dust collector for me. I, I was... Uh, they really should have bond, bundled one of the Bonk games with the Turbo graphics, and I think if they had done that, um, the Genesis wouldn't have walloped it so much in the U.S., but, I mean, the Genesis absolutely destroyed the Turbo. I mean, that's basically what what happened is uh, you know the Sega Genesis had 60 65 percent of the market by 1991 and um, they were even uh, just killing Nintendo the NES just obviously was was far behind and couldn't catch up to the Genesis and, and graphics quality so this in a, for all intents and purposes the Super Nintendo was kind of a rush job and you can tell uh, that's why the backward compatibility never got working on the Super Nintendo. They intended to make the Super Nintendo backward compatible with the, uh, the NES, and they couldn't get it to work in time, and it never did get it working. Um, and, and, and some of their architectural choices for the Super Nintendo, you know, they gave it that kind of slow CPU to try to maintain that backward compatibility with the NES, and then they didn't get it work, so they kind of saddled that machine with a really slow CPU for the backward compatibility that never got working. So the Super Nintendo, in hindsight, was kind of a mess. And it's one of the reasons why I never really cared for that system is, you know, they, they really had uh, you know, the Mode 7 graphics. If it weren't for that, the Super Nintendo probably wouldn't have been a commercial success. I mean, those those games like F-Zero and everything kind of sold those game consoles, Pilot Wings and that thing. Um, but... Um, Oh, looks like I just died, and that's my last... Oh, no, I got one more. But um, you'll notice that I do kind of ramble sometimes, especially when I'm playing video games. Um, this is this is a, a great title. Um, I would definitely say if, if you're going to start out with, with some Turbo Graphics, collecting some Turbo Graphics, um, you know, introducing yourself to the Turbo Graphics, you should definitely start with one of these games. Well, that's about it for me. Uh, thanks for joining me for this first play, and I hope you enjoyed it and maybe got something out of uh, my commentary.